Welcome to the Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian and with Mike, and we're reading through Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Matron series of books that we most love in the world. Yeah. Ian, would you be so good as to catch us up with where we are and tell us where we're going? With great pleasure, Mike, for sure. Last time, Stephen had learned from Midshipman Reed that men had been coming and going out of Clarissa Oaks's cabin, as he described it, like a bawdy house. And learned from Martin that Clarissa's husband, Oakes himself, had beaten her. And the relationships with Clarissa and the men around are not going great. The officers were paying strangely less and less attention to Clarissa. She also seemed to be disregarding her husband. Now, on the voyage, the surprise had stopped at Anamuka Island to trade for water and supplies, and there had learned from Wainwright, the master of the disabled whaler named Daisy, that French-American privateer called the Franklin now supports a ruler called Kalahua, the northern chief on the island of Moahu, which is where Jack is headed for. And this ruler had detained British ships and sailors, all part of his war against the southern queen on that island, Pualani. That was last week. This time, Mike, as we dig deeper and deeper into Clarissa Oaks slash the true love, we have trading and some hijinks going on ashore. We learn secondhand about the leader of that French-American crew and how they're threatening Moahu. Stephen, meanwhile, is going to learn firsthand about the dark personal history that brought Clarissa to this point, which goes some way toward explaining her current situation among the crew of the surprise. And for those of you who are playing the long game here, gives some important clues about treachery going on many thousands of miles away in the heart of the British establishment. And this week, the discussion is going to turn to topics of abuse and in particular sexual abuse. If you'd rather not listen to that part of the conversation, then by all means, enjoy the first half of the show up to the halftime break and then maybe skip the second half. Otherwise, let's get to it. Mike, it's a big chapter this week. It is a big chapter, Ian. And boy, like you say, the long game. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that. But wow, another like, whoa, didn't see that coming here. Well, we joined the chapter and we could certainly see this coming. Stephen and Jack have been playing music together. It's late at night. And Jack's now bringing Stephen in on his Moahu orders. He's feeling a little bit awkward by Stephen's complete silence as Jack tries to explain why he didn't tell Stephen earlier. Jack says he's now convinced that Sidney did not realize Stephen might provide him with any advice other than medical advice. And Jack had learned from Wainwright that the sides on Moahu are no longer evenly divided as his orders had originally assumed that, that, you know, a French privateer and its commander are now joining the Northern chief in the war against Pulani. That commander, Jean Dutour, said that after the North and South have worn each other out, he's going to destroy the chief and his allies and turn the place into a paradise. So I think we remember Jack was so worried about talking to Stephen with this whole colonization aspect going on. But now he's like, OK, it's the French, Stephen. The French are going to get these folks. Yeah. And, and Stephen is now OK with the situation. What joy, he says, it couldn't be improved. And I think he might be ironically talking about, of, of course, you can't fail bringing a colony seeking utopia to a desert island. And of course, it couldn't be approved to find the French doing all of this dirty work. You know, this, this is the place that I like to get involved in. So he tells Jack, meanwhile, that he's pretty well acquainted with this guy, Dutour, had met him in Paris, had read his works, had read his thinking about equality, the perfectibility of human nature, and the essential goodness of mankind for many years. And Mike, this has got shades of Stephen's revulsion against Rousseau many, many books ago, which we, which we talked about before. Right. So he's across what Dutour likes to do and what his intentions might be here. He explains that Dutour is using his wealth to help people. He's trying to get Jews settled in South America to provide farms and manufacturing jobs for young criminals. And all of this sounds outwardly like really progressive and well-intentioned. Stephen thinks, though, that Wainwright might have been a bit excessive in describing Dutour's Machiavellian desire to knock the current leaders on the head, although he's pretty willing to believe that Dutour could be ruthless in defense of a system that he believes in. And he's known to be very, very short with dissenters. So he's not quite the genial Papa Smurf that we might be led to believe here. We know 
from past conversations that Stephen's been associated with people involved in the revolutionary movement in, in Europe. His prime objection to the French Revolution seemed to be the way this is all working out here. This is the reason that he's working for Britain now, that there's, there's no such thing as a utopia. And he goes on to say that he knew of Dutour having influenced an American commander, and we'll learn some more about who that is and how in a few chapters' time. But all of this discourse about Dutour and philosophy and the rights of man is cut off by no less a philosopher than Killick appearing below the cabin window. And he hasn't been philosophizing, has he, Mike? Not quite. No, no, he really has not. You know, and I, I think he attracts Jack's attention out the window and Jack calls out and says to Killick, you know, what are you doing to that young woman? And Killick replies, well, it's all quite right. Nothing, nothing at all. Perfectly natural. Uh, I'm just saying goodnight since she brought me out to the ship after he'd missed the Liberty boat, which had departed so soon. Hmm. So, you know, we, we get this uh, one of many of this chapter's commentaries about relations between men and women here. But there's an, another literary illusion that I had walked past here, Ian, in this in this paragraph. Yeah, it's funny. I remember reading, just breezing past this. Killick is described as being totty from his swink. And I had always supposed that that was some kind of old English, he's a bit drunk. Actually, this is a quote. This is a quote from Geoffrey Chaucer's The Reeves Tale, one of the Canterbury Tales. And being totty from your swink means being giddy from your labours. And in The Reeves Tale, the characters, the male characters, go from bed to bed and from partner to partner, bragging about where they're going next and who they're going with and where they've just been. And maybe, maybe we're more than invited to speculate that Totty from the Swing, Giddy from the Erotic Labours isn't just a description of Killick. It's kind of a description of lots of the crew here. And Killick is n nowhere near being into this illusion, of course. He's still uh, trying to find his way in and not completely to disgrace himself. The boarding nets are up, so he can't come in over the gunnels. He wanted to come in through the quarter gallery, and Jack says, well, come on in by the sash light. And we get this nice little comic moment of slapstick. Killick misses, tries to jump in from the canoe and falls in the water with his big splash of phosphorescence. Finally, the young lady gives him a shove. And I love the description here of him arriving in the cabin. Sodden, resentful, and sadly out of countenance, going straight through the door with a bowed head, a mumble, and a gesture towards the forelock. That's a, a very <laughs> a very much chastised Killick there. And Jack and Stephen, as the text says, sit back, each secretly pleased with having acquired a moral advantage over Killick at last. I, I wonder how long that will go on for. Right, right. Not too long, I suspect. But, well, Jack gets back. He's reading from his orders to Stephen that Moahu already belongs to the British crown because Cook took possession of it in 1778. And Stephen notes that probably the chiefs, the people, and as he says, the lady in question, don't really take that seriously. They see it as a polite formality. And Jack says, you know, what lady are you talking about? And Stephen says, why, Pualani, Wainwright's poor, weak woman, the queen of the South. And you know, the phrase poor, weak woman coming out of Stephen's mouth just struck me as like, wait, wait, he's, I don't think he's being exactly <laughs> straight here. You know, it doesn't seem characteristic of him, although it does get back. And we've had a couple conversations recently about this idea of agency of women in a, a patriarchy, yeah. uh, you know, and about these times here. And so I think Stephen might have been poking a little fun at this poor weak woman here. Yeah, he's poking fun at the phrase. He's poking fun at the attitude that he presumes we yes. all have. And I'm sure this is not the only time in this chapter we're going to think about the difference in, in social power between men and women. So, poor weak woman. We'll, we'll wait to see just how poor or weak Queen Polani really turns out to be. Right. Well, you know, I, I think sometimes again, I see it in myself in earlier days, too, that, yeah. you know, as men, we're, we're kind of thinking, oh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help this woman because she's not capable or yeah. some sort of yeah. assumption like that. And, you know, that I, I wouldn't help another man and telling ourselves that he is capable. But sometimes I kind of wonder... Is it because the man's presumed capable or is it because we're not hitting on the man? So. Yeah, very good. And and it's funny, we're going to talk about this a lot. That The, the book has a, a female title, especially if you read the, read the British imprint I'm, of it. You might believe that the book is all about Clarissa Oakes. I, I think the book is really all about the actions of the men yes. to, to and around her. And we're getting a little hint of the 
attitude and the agency issues that Patrick O'Brien's trying to dig into here. Subtle right. at first, um, not so subtle later on in the chapter. Well, Stephen then assumes that Jack is going to back the Southern Queen, Puolani, against what he calls the doubly inimical French-American privateer and supposes that being a subject to the, the remote British king, King George, uh, seems to be a less dreadful fate than under the immediate and present rule of France or America or the architect of a system that roots up every form of social existence known to man and that is very likely to hurry unbelievers or heretics to the stake. And he's really skewered the wow. revolutionary utopian zeal of Dutour there. Well done, Stephen. And Jack, in return, asks Stephen if he Stephen has any objections to this mission. And Stephen says, as you know very well, we, we get now the, the Stephen speech on nations and freedom that we've had ever since Master and Commander. He says, I am in favor of leaving people alone, however imperfect their polity might seem. It appears to me that you must not tell other nations how to set their house in order, nor must you compel them to be happy. But I too am a naval officer, brother. Long, long ago, you taught me that anyone nourished on ship's biscuit must learn to choose, drum roll, please, the yes. lesser of two weevils. Yeah, well done, Steve. <laughs> I love it. On that basis, he finishes off. On that basis alone, I may be said to have no objection to Moa, who is becoming a nominal British possession. Well, it's good Jack's got Stephen on board now here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, we keep going. Jack's eating his first breakfast the next day, served by a haggard, mournful, unnaturally submissive killick. <laughs> so, yeah. Always, always, you know, a rare to see that, but fun to see it here. And Wainwright comes over from the Daisy. He's kind of giving him an update on what's happening on the island, that the senior chief is back and is going to change some of the agreements that Jack had with the junior chief yesterday. And Jack asks Wainwright to help him with the exchanges that are coming up. He wants to do everything right. He wants to lose no time to get the food and the water that he needs. And, and Wainwright says, you know, happy to help you here. A pahi, they note, pulls off from the shore. It's being paddled by girls carrying Torero, the top chief, Torero's sister, and lots of gifts. There's cloth and fruit and hogs and chicken and native clubs, sugar cane. And the crew on the surprise is captivated by the bare-chested paddlers who are bringing the pahi towards the surprise here. Wainwright elegantly translates Jack's thanks he requests to visit later to bring presents, to ask the chief's leave to trade uh, and to get water. And he invites the sister and her two maidens to join him in the cabin. Very nice. And, and Mike, I'm struck by how the vessel that brings them out is a pahi. And the first, and maybe even the, the, the most recent previous time we heard about a pahi was in the far side of the world. And that was Jack and Stephen being rescued by a bunch of women in a pahi. And that was a story about gender as well. So maybe in some corner of O'Brien's mind, the idea of this particular kind of Polynesian canoe is connected with uh, with the connection between the sexes. We'll we'll have to see. Meanwhile, now that this trading is 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 foreseen, it's about to take place. Stephen is astonished to see how quickly all this activity builds up on the shore. He sees supplies being built up. The colours of the island and the harbour are really beautiful. The pahi that sails by is full of fish sent to set up the trade on shore. Stephen's watching a flock of parrots that he can't identify and a fast flying pigeon. Meanwhile, upon coming back the other way, water is sent to come aboard the surprise and on shore, the surprise's hands with the guidance of Wainwright, who knows the language and knows the local markets, get on with trading. They're trading bottles, metal, glass, cloth, hats, and as the text says, gourds, beads, and trinkets. All of these for food that's really, really needed, including many small razor-backed long-legged hogs. And we should stick a pin in hog. We're going to come back to the whole the whole piggery of it all in a couple of seconds. Right. And it's really touching that Sarah and Emily are pleased to see these pigs. And they're the same as the hogs on their home island. And for a moment here, we get a little nice moment of nostalgia for Sarah and, and Emily thinking about times past and having a little happy, teary moment thinking about their history. And Mike, knowing a little bit about what's coming in the later parts of this chapter, th this seemed to me like the, the peak set up for a beautiful, bucolic, colourful, natural, joyful life because the narrative is going to take a very different turn. We've got Stephen looking at beautiful animals and birds on the wing. We've got all the rich, colourful description of light and colour and shape with all of these trinkets. 
And we've got the girls happy to think about the past. And there are quite a few things about that that are going to be switched over in the uh, in the coming paragraphs. And meanwhile, let's give a little shout out for Gauds, G-A-U-D-S. I'd never heard of the word gourd being used as a noun. It's an archaic form. We all use the word gaudy. And a gourd is a flashy or extravagant or fanciful looking gift of some kind. And that's a good description for all this stuff that's being traded here. Well, you had mentioned the pigs, Ian, and, and sure enough, <laughs> the hogs that are on deck are, are anxious and frightened, especially when they hear the cries of the rest of the hogs that are sort of down below deck. They're, they're making this hideous din. And we get this story that starts to play itself out between Waitman, the butcher who's in charge of the hogs, and Jimmy Ducks, who the little girls are trying to convince that these hogs are hungry and and they're not feeding the right things. They need to feed them some taro. And, uh, you know, Jimmy doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to talk to the butcher. It's not his job. And sure enough, when the girls finally convince him to do so, the butcher is pretty sharp with him and said, who did he think he was telling the Barkey's butcher about hogs? Did Waitman tell Jimmy Ducks how to look after his fucking hens or turtles? Turtles kiss my ass. In any case, the hogs below had been fed. They'd been offered every goddamn thing the ship contained, from bread to tobacco, passing by a prime bucket of swill. And would they touch it? No, Squire, they would not. And Waitman would be buggered if he offered them anything again. They would be salted and put up while there was still any flesh on their bones. And if he, Jimmy Ducks, didn't like it, why, he could do the other thing. So, <laughs> woo! <laughs> Oh, it, it's a great little mo- I, I should remember these kind of outbursts. I should be able to come up with these on demand. <laughs> now, the, there's going to be a whole story around the hogs. It, it, we're going to come back to what's going on with the hogs. And Mike, I, I remember reading this and thinking, why are we getting so much? So, so, what's, what's, what's with all the pork going on here? I can't understand it. And there's a, there's a really interesting connection that we might come to in a second. But let's, let's leave off there. We've got Wayman and Jamie Ducks and the girls trying to figure out their way around how to nourish these hogs. All of this activity going on pushes Stephen to the taffrail. And who does he often find at the taffrail but Mrs. Oaks? She's enraptured looking across at the land. She's taking in this really colourful bucolic scene as well. Her delight is, as the text says, making her look more nearly beautiful than Stephen had ever seen her. And also physically better, in better shape, despite of the remainder of this black eye that she got from Oaks. She tells Stephen that she's longed to travel, longed to make distant voyages, almost mentions her voyage to New South Wales, which is something she's really steered clear of talking about in the past. And she says this is what she thought it would be like. She wants to capture the picture of this moment off this South Seas Island forever in her mind. She yearns passionately to go ashore, and she really hopes that the captain is going to grant Oaks some leave. And we might we, we get we drop now back into another little vignette of the pigs, and this time Padine is getting involved. He's really upset. He sees this this torment going on. The butcher is tormenting the hogs. And let, let's just say that, that maybe there's some application here. How do people behave when they are individuals versus how do they behave when they're a herd? There's something about the herd mentality of the hogs here. But let, let let's keep on going. Stephen walks forward with Padine. And Sarah runs towards them, yelling that they can keep telling Jemmy Ducks to tell the butcher that they need to be given taro, the hogs need to be given taro, but Jemmy just won't listen. And here we get a really interesting turn in this conversation. Stephen turns to Martin and says, this is this whole hog business, this is a matter for the captain. And he sees that Jack's boat has put off from the shore. And Martin says that Sarah and Emily had privately told him that just a little taro in the pig's will would do. But Waitman... He's not interested. He is beyond reason. He's pig-headed. And Mike, at, at first glance, this just sounds like a pun. This sounds a bit like curtailed. But I wonder if there's a connection here. Yeah, yeah. And this this whole, you know, we, we've been talking about men and women. And there, there was a just a little point in here, too, where they were kind of going back on Stephen and Padine, how they had a little bit of a special reverence for hogs from their childhood and growing up because they saw hogs as individuals, not just a member of the herd. And when we get to the interactions between men and women, I wonder if that note plays out a little bit here as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we're waiting for the captain to come aboard. And Stephen and Martin continue to talk. They both agree that they can't wait to be on shore. They speculate what they might find there. And then Martin tells Stephen that he has actually a little good and bad news he has to share with him. He said that when the Islanders were bringing on board all these gifts for the ship, that Martin had seen two rails unknown to the learned world and a different purple coot. So, you know, Martin's found a couple of birds here that we really don't know anything about. Martin decided that, you know, that's going to be more important to science than it is going to be adding to the gun room's dinner table. And he appropriated them. I loved his his use of the word appropriated. (laughs) But he also reports, though, now for the bad news, that he had left out some of he and Stephen's birds that they're, you know, in the process of dissecting and classifying, and that the crew members have stolen the red feathers from all the bird samples that were left out. And oh. Steve is, you know, he's just really upset by that. He curses them, you know, he wishes them pox and eternal damnation. He says that he's knowing that they're going to trade them for the one thing that they want, you know. <laughs> So it's yeah, this yeah. reflection of there's only one thing on guys' minds and, and another theme running through this chapter, I think. Yeah, indeed. Except, as we're going to talk about through the chapter, when you can distract the guy with one of his bizarre hobbies. Right. And right. in this case, you can distract Stephen by offering him the chance to dissect a bird. And that's what exactly what happens. Jack comes back aboard and Stephen heads off to dissect the birds that he's got here. And Oaks finds him gathering equipment together in the sick berth and says, would you do me a kindness and take Mrs. Oaks ashore because I'm too busy with the ship? And Stephen, fatefully, I think, agrees to, takes his instruments up and tells Martin that, oh, I've agreed to take Mrs. Oaks ashore as well on this trip that you and I are both going to take. And suddenly Martin's expression changes. He pauses and says, in this very artificial sounding way, I forgot to tell you that I'm engaged to the, to the doctor, to the surgeon of the whaler. And clearly things are not entirely as they should be between Martin and Clarissa. When he discovers that she's going on this short trip ashore, he says, I'm not going there. So Stephen gets to go ashore with just Clarissa. Uh, And Joe Place is on hand to help. He sets Stephen and his fowling piece and his game bag and Mrs. Oaks all ashore and tells Stephen to watch out for lions, tigers and vipers. And once again, we're going to just juxtapose all of the natural history, all of the nature and all of the other kind of predatory creatures that might abound on the surface of the world, lots of them walking on two legs. Right. Now, they're at the market. There's trading going on. They walk around the market. Clarissa had asked twice to see it. Clarissa, in turn, sees Stephen, distractible as always, staring at two doves flying. And she suggests that maybe they should go botanizing. Stephen says, well, okay, we, we, we can look at the boat. Well, Stephen says they can look at the boat, which has brought even more things to market. And I I love this description that O'Brien gives us in the text. Although Clarissa could be imperceptive and even stupid on the occasion, there were times when no amount of civil disguise could hide a man's real desires from her. And in this case, the disguise called for no great penetration. So Clarissa's pretty sure that she knows what's on Stephen's mind. And she's all about trying to keep track of what's distracting the men here. Off they walk into the brushwood. And after time, distraction upon distraction, a flock of parrots takes wing. Stephen shoots and bags a nondescript parrot. Nondescript meaning, you know, new to science. And I love, Mike, how Stephen's been distracted by so many birds. Pretty much every paragraph since we started this chapter, some new bird has flown into view. The last chapter, we had the uh, the ancient murrelet. We've had pigeons, doves, rails, coots, and now the parrots. We've got feathers being bartered and traded, in particular red feathers. Probably not a coincidence that that's the same colour as the silk that was found for Clarissa's red gown that was also going to be a present for Sophie. So I think all of this bird-related and colour-related symbolism is being piled up for us here by O'Brien, and I think we're meant to take notice. Right, right. Well, Clarissa and Stephen are walking out into the bush there. Stephen had shot that one bird a woman hearing that had come out and you know invited them into the shade of her house, gave you know given them some dried fish. Clarissa had given her a little glass-headed pin in return, and they 
leave talking about how hard the ground feels. Clarissa is asking Stephen, doesn't the ground feel so hard when you've been on the ship for some time? And there is this, you know, we're going to hear later a little bit of the difference between being ashore and being on ships here. Well, they're having this conversation, but Stephen stops, as you said, distraction. He sees this beetle that he knows Sir Joseph would love, and he runs after it here. And so, uh, you know, returning to Clarissa, she's taken off her shoes. She's bathing her feet in a stream at the bottom of this breadfruit tree near where Stephen had originally spotted the beetle. He had to go off chasing it here. And Clarissa says she's found something even better. You know, she's been talking about all these wonderful things and wanting to travel the world and see these wonderful things. Well, now something even better, three beautiful kinds of orchids. And she says everyone can have their tigers and bears. The beautiful flowers are what she means by foreign travel. And I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't help but think this is sort of a little poke at Stephen here. You know, you can have your, you know, it's like, oh, I'm being all nice and wonderful and let's go do this. Oh, oh, now I really love the flower. That's what I really love. But I, And yeah. Mike, I, we've dug a lot into the origins of words in this chapter. Orchids are named because their name has the same stem as the Greek word for for, the, for male genitalia, for testicles in particular. So we're, we're not short of symbolism in the natural world all the way through this chapter. Right. And and the Greeks you know, associated orchids and fertility. That, yeah. that, that could be a little bit of a gotcha here. So it, we, we started out with this being a sort of fair to medium day for the pigs. It turns out it hasn't been a great day for the pigs because Clarissa and Stephen sit down to a picnic lunch. They eat wine, plum duff and fruit and guess what pork sandwiches <laughs> and after this little picnic meal clarissa is feeling very very mellow she asks his forgiveness she says she's feeling absurdly sleepy with all the pleasure and the excitement and she wonders if he minds if she lies down in some deeper shade and stephen says okay i'm going to go botanizing once again able to use his distractions to keep him away from the temptations of the flesh stephen asks clarissa if she knows how to use his fowling piece his gun and uh yeah, insert metaphor joke here. Does she know how to handle one of those? I think she really does. She looks as if he's made a joke that she strongly resents. And maybe this is the flash of that Medea side of her character that we talked about before. But then she says, oh, yes, quite kind of airily and naturally. And maybe it's not just the joke about can she handle a gun or not. Maybe she's put off again by the idea of being asked a question. So if she owns up to knowing how to use a gun, maybe that's too much of a pry into some of her personal history. And maybe then, a little bit like Louisa Wogan many books ago, a gun might have been involved in getting her sent to Botany Bay. Anyhow, Stephen leaves her with the fowling piece. He says it's loaded and tells her, watch out, Martin and his surgeon friend might join them. And she says, I doubt it. So not only does Martin know there's bad blood between Martin and Clarissa, Clarissa knows there's bad blood between Martin and Clarissa. And Mike, I, I can't help but let my mind drift back to pork sandwiches and wine and plum duff and fruit. Yeah, and and, and I sure need a break. I, I remember as I got to this point, I was thinking, wait a minute, Stephen's leaving her with a loaded gun in case something scares her. We know Martin and the surgeon may come up and Stephen's heading off in the woods. So yeah, let's definitely have the pork sandwiches and wine <laughs> and, and relax a little bit here. Well, well, we'll go try and relax and you go grab yourselves a pork sandwich and we'll be right back after this break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Well, welcome back. I hope pork or a vegetarian substitute, whatever works for you, has delighted you and gotten you enough energy as we continue on with Stephen and Clarissa. Stephen realizes that Clarissa, you know, he'd upset her. He wasn't really sure why. And so he's, as he comes back, he's checking on her mood and it doesn't seem to be much better. Now, He's got a respectable collection of botanical specimens, but of course he has no birds because he had no gun. And I think as he was out, you know, sort of hunting, he was a bit resentful about that, that, you know, she didn't realize what he'd given up there. She hopes that he found what he'd hoped for out there 
And he's sensing that, you know, there's really no hostility, no offense now on her side. And, and he thinks, you know, maybe she just reached too high a pitch of spirits and now she's kind of coming down and with her fatigue that had made her short. So he also sees she has a badly blistered heel and Stephen realizes, you know, she really can't walk any further into the forest. And, you know, the botanizing, the natural philosophizing is now over and he tries to restore their earlier mood. He tells her all about the captain ordering the butcher to mix taro with a hog swill to the delight of Sarah and Emily. And then he actually went so far as to turn control over the hogs, now categorized as lambs, to Jemmy Ducks. So the girls are really pleased with that. And Stephen is really pleased that the girls being, as he says, discreet beyond their years, you know, are not going around talking about it. They're not wounding the butcher's feelings with this. So, you know, they're kind of taking care of the butcher. And I thought, oh, this is this is a fascinating little aside here. It is. And it, it gets Clarissa talking. It's on all these little associations and references to the girls slowly, slowly get her starting to open up about her history. She says that she loves the girls, but that they, the girls, have taken against her to what she calls a quite wounding degree. And there's a little interlude while Stephen goes off and shoots and brings back two parrots. And she continues with this really telling phrase about her character. I so dislike being disliked. And there's this really awkward pause. And she says, that reminds me of poor little Mr. Reed. How does he do? (laughs) So somebody with whom there's been some liking and then some disliking, I guess. Stephen says that Reed is doing well, and she wonders if with his injury now, he can still have a career in the Navy. And Stephen says that with the honourable wound, with his excellent connections and the captain's glowing report, then, in quotes here, if he is not killed first, he will die an admiral. And Clarissa decides to keep the conversation rolling here, and she asks about the other officers. And Stephen says that, well, Pullings, he'll get made post when he makes his way home. And she asks whether the same is true for Weston Davidge, whether whether they might get reinstated, in fact. Stephen says he's no judge, but he doubts it. And in commentary, he says here, the beach is littered with failed sea officers, including courageous and capable men. And Clarissa says, well, that's as maybe, but the captain was reinstated. And Stephen goes on to talk about the virtues of Jack Aubrey. He says the captain has martial virtues, a great fighting captain, is wealthy, has high-placed friends, and an unshakable seat in Parliament. And we've had this inventory of all these attributes and future prospects for men in the right place and with the right skills and the right antecedents. And uh, and Clarissa's look and tone start to change. She says she's happy to be sitting in the shade with all these beautiful flowers and with a man who does not ply her with questions or pay constant attention to her, or she says, ply her with assiduities, you know? So uh, this is interesting. And she says, because of that, she knows that she can ask Stephen a question and that he won't think that she's fishing. So she asks if her eye, her black eye still shows much, you know, that she doesn't have a mirror on board and can't look for it. And Stephen says, well, it really can no longer be called a black eye. And Clarissa has an interesting response. She says, I do not give a straw for men qua men, but I still like to look agreeable or at least passable. As I said before, I do loathe being disliked and ugliness and dislike seem to go together. So, Ian, as you had said, boy, some real telling comments about Clarissa's character, about her beliefs about men and women and and that sort of thing. Wow. Yeah. And you can see what's going on a little bit in her mind as she makes the next step back to another topic of conversation. She goes back to the to the girls. And she asks Stephen about the background of Sarah and Emily and asks what's going to happen to them. And he explains how they had rescued Sarah and Emily from the island. He mentions his intention to have Mrs. Broad back in London care for them at her warm, comfortable tavern until he, Stephen, figures out something better for them. Clarissa stumbles twice over the next statement that she's trying to get out. And she says that she hopes Mrs. Broad can keep them safe, not misused until they're old enough to make their way. 
And she expresses this hope that they haven't already been misused, even though they are, in her observation, such plain creatures. And Stephen says, well, the, the, the girls are very young, but this reference to childhood and misuse and the appearance of girls is clearly setting some cogs turning in Clarissa's mind here. Yeah, they really are, Ian. You know, Clarissa says that she was younger still and adds that as a medical man, Stephen must have come across incestuous families. He says that he has. Mm. And she says, well, incestuous may be too strong a word that her cousin Edward was only a remote connection and that she went to him along with his niece, Frances, you know, who was about her age in a large house with a park and a lake when she was Emily's size. That Edward was a thin, nervous, not very old, although she thought of him that way, man, living in a house with old servants from his parents' day. That he had taught Clarissa and Francis Latin and English, and that there were what she called a string of unfortunate French governesses that taught the other subjects, but they never stayed on because the house was too remote and not reachable by carriage in winter. She said that, you know, she didn't particularly care for Francis nor Francis her, but they played together because they were the only company they had and that they were both jealous for cousin Edward's regard, which made them very competitive in their lessons. Now, an old Aunt Cheney lived upstairs, but never left her room. And that Aunt Cheney and Mrs. Bellingham from the bishops taught the girls etiquette and to be quiet. Her guardian, she said, disliked visitors, and there were almost none to the house other than tradesmen. So, boy, I'm, I know, you know, at this point, I'm starting to get just a little bit, whoa, what's coming here? Yeah, and, and, and she's disclosing her personal history to him. She goes on and talks about what was happening in the house where she was living there. She says that she liked this guy, her guardian, except for, and here she pauses and wonders how to explain it without being gross, he and the girls played games together, including what they called games in the dark. And the games went from hide and seek and pretending to eat the girls to, as the text says, a different turn. He was always very gentle. He hardly ever hurt me. And he seemed to think that though our game was private, it was of no great importance. And she says that she and Francis had never spoken about it until they went to a French Dominican school at Winchester. And by the way, a French Dominican school in Winchester would have been a, a, a school run by Catholics, and that would have been quite an unusual thing in Regency England. And this monologue, O'Brien calls it a toneless monologue, this very kind of cold, dispassionate way she has of fishing up these terrible memories and describing them to Stephen, that changes to a regular voice when she suddenly sort of snaps out of this and says, do you know Winchester? And Stephen just says, no, I do not. And all this is really, really a dark personal history, games in the dark, private, but somehow in her memory of no great importance. This is somebody who's who's been through a, a really, really traumatic experience. Well, in Winchester, she was boarding with other girls her age, many of them emigres' daughters, so probably a lot of people fleeing the French Revolution. And therefore, you know, Ian, to your point, you know, coming from France, probably a lot of Catholics as well. And she said there were whispers and giggles there with the girls and wild suppositions about marriage, childbirth, and what went before it. She says that she and Francis looked at each other with perfect understanding, but that neither of them mentioned it in words. And Clarissa started to understand what had happened to her, you know, in, in her youth before her, but she still couldn't make out why there was so much fuss. And then she gives us a Latin tag to describe her feelings. She says, the first part of foida est in coitu et brevis voluptas, I could understand perfectly well, but not the second. I could not associate it with the least degree of pleasure, however short, and so a great deal that I had read and heard, romantic attachments, swimming the Hellespont and so on, remained incomprehensible insofar as they were for that end, the right, true end. So this is the story that she's grown up with in her head about sex that foida est, uh, filthy and brief, she could get. But the second half about pleasure, she really couldn't understand. 
there's a, a huge amount for us to dig into here, Mike. Um, we've had a, a bit of advice once again from our friend Karen, who's been helping us decode some of the Latin here. Yeah, Karen, so kind to help us last chapter. And I, I reached out to say, you know, this one's coming up. Tell us a little bit more about that. And she says that although, you know, the construction's a little loose, she is, as you say, in saying that, you know, she understands the filthy part of sex, but not the pleasure part of coitus here, intercourse here. And, and the line actually comes from an ode written by Petronius. Gaius Petronius Arbiter uh, lived from about 27 to 66 A.D., and was a Roman courtier in the reign of Nero. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a website, the Sub Sub Librarian, that translates the first line and the rest of its verse as, filthy and brief is the pleasure taken in sex, and passion carried to its end straightway disgusts. And so let us not, like rutting beasts, blind and headlong rush to the end, for desire withers and the flame dies. But let us lie like this, just like this, playing idly without end and kissing. Here is no exertion and no reason to turn red. This is please, does please, and long will please. This does not cease and ever is just beginning. So, you know, we're going to hear a little bit more from Petronius, as Karen notes, when we get to chapter eight, this guy. And, and, Ian, we heard, you know, this Latin tag, and boy, it tells us a lot about, as you say, what Clarissa grew up with. Now, we also heard her talk about what I read and heard about romantic attachments and swimming the Hellespont and so on. That remained incomprehensible to her. You know, right. any, you know, where in the world is this swimming the Hellespont coming from? Well, it's really fascinating. The, the Hellespont is the, the waterway that more or less se separates Asian Turkey from European Turkey and from the Greek mainland. It refers to the Greek myth of Hero and Leander. Hero, who was a priestess of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, lived in a tower in the town of Sestos on the European side of the Hellespont, what we would call these days the Dardanelles Strait or the Straits of Gallipoli. And Leander, a young man, lived on the opposite side, the Asian side, in a town called Abydos. Leander fell in love with Hera and would swim across the Hellespont nightly to see her, guided by the torch at the top of Hera's tower. And they would agree to part for the winter because the rough seas meant that they couldn't see each other and they would come back to see each other again in the spring. But one stormy winter night, Leander sees the torch at the top of Hera's tower, starts to swim across, and a strong wind blows the light out. Leander loses his way and drowns, and when Hero sees his dead body, she throws herself off the tower to be with him in death. I'm like, this, this sounds like the, the, the classic tragic story arc here, but this is the kind of really passionate, all-embracing, romantic ideal of love that is a completely closed book to Clarissa. Right, right. You know, she says she doesn't understand these romantic attachments like swimming the Hellespont for love. And you're right, this is classic romance, but I don't think we're going to be seeing this replayed in a Hallmark Christmas movie this year. I hope no, not. No. It's right. But, no, Romeo and Juliet type romance, not holiday, yes. <laughs> not parent exactly. trap type romance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That, that word has kind of changed, as they say. I don't think that means what you think it means anymore. Yeah. But what she's really saying, I think, is that, you know, she can't believe that anybody would walk across the room for sex, much less risk their lives swimming across a strait in winter here. It just yeah. doesn't make sense to her. Now, Karen points out that this would have been well on the minds of everybody at this time period, too, the time of the book, that yeah. there's a connection to what's going on you know, in the real timeline, right? So at that time, Lord Byron references Leander and Hero, and he writes this piece about written after swimming from Sestos to Abydos. So this myth had inspired him to do his own swim across the Hellespont. And in May 1810, Byron swam across it, and then he alludes not only in this piece to it, but again in his further works, The Bride of Abydos and in Don Juan. So you know, very much, uh, you know, an on-point reference for O'Brien. And Karen says there might be another thing in the context of our story 
this idea of disastrously misread signals that, you know, this fire going on with Leander thinking this is telling him to come, come now for this sexual liaison and yeah, misread signal here and then the fire blowing out. But we found, you know, and we can almost imagine Patrick O'Brien winking at us, a, a naval Easter egg to the Hellespont story here. Yeah, absolutely. An- another author who references Hero and Leander and Hellespont in a, in a nautical connection is Richard Henry Darner Jr., fa- famous author of a famous book about life under sail called Two Years Before the Mast. Now, Two Years Before the Mast was written in 1840. And we know we've read in, in the uh, Dean King biography, we get a clear claim that O'Brien knew and would have read and understood Richard Darner's work. Now, in Two Years Before the Mast, Darner tells the anecdote of the ship's cook who had so bonded with the sow, old Bess, who was on board for months that it became this really great relationship. So hang on a second. First of all, we've got a reference to pigs. Right. We're going to go all the way back to the hogs. So we've got a human bonding with the hog. After the, this sow, this pig, had been taken ashore in San Diego, Donna's book says, the cook could hardly have been more attentive, for he actually, on several nights after dark, when he thought he would not be seen, sculled himself ashore in a boat with a bucket of nice swill and returned like Leander from crossing the Hellespont. And this is great. We've got the swill and the pigs and the butcher and Hero and Leander and the Hellespont. We, we, we have a pig-headed butcher, so, so determined. Men being angry and pig-headed around Clarissa, a woman who was once a young girl in need of compassion and care. It's lovely how all these things tie up, Mike. It's really, really great that you dug this out. Yeah, I was amazed to find that there. But, you know... Let's get back to Clarissa because we're yeah, not yeah. done yet, right? These incredible revelations here. Clarissa's, you know, when she was talking to Stephen, you know, just a minute ago, telling him about the other girls, talking about, you know, kind of what went before marriage and childbirth, and that knowing look passing between her and Francis, Clarissa adds at the end of that, so we concealed our knowledge of these matters. So they didn't talk about what they knew, what had gone on with them and their cousin Edwards. And we soon learned to control our learning, too. We knew far more Latin than the other girls. That was one of the reasons for our unpopularity. So again, we're back with women and agency. And even here among the girls, you got to not be too smart here. But then she adds, my violence was another. And it's like, what? (laughs) So it's just... You know, it's amazing how many things we're hitting head on right here in, in a couple paragraphs time. Yeah, she's she, she looks askance at the merest mention of a fouling piece, but now in her side of the conversation, telling the story freely from her own experience, she mentions her violence. Huh. Well, the, the story goes on. The nuns then had sent Clarissa and Francis home. Clarissa says she can't blame them. When they got back home, Aunt Cheney had died. Many of the servants had been turned away. Nobody called at the house anymore. And there was only the library, the lessons, and the game in the dark that were much the same. And later, a new man came on the scene, and Mr. Southam, a big, coarse, arrogant army officer with some very nasty ways, joined in with the games. And Cousin Edward told the girls to be particularly kind to Mr. Southam. And Mike, I thought this dark chapter couldn't get any darker, but we have this really heartbreaking disclosure here. We hid as hard as ever we could when he was there. But that was mostly because of his smell and general unpleasantness. The thing itself was of no consequence. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So they're in this house. They're being exploited by not only the cousin, but also this this evil-smelling guy, Mr. Southam. They're getting poorer. It seemed like constant winter in Clarissa's recollection. Only the library was heated and the silver had disappeared. There were gypsies camping in the park where the wall had fallen down. The only servants left were two old women who couldn't get work elsewhere. Frances was sent to Yorkshire and Clarissa never saw her again. She thinks that the men had got her with child and she died either bearing the child or getting rid of it. And as we get into this, Clarissa's speech has now gone from being quite cold and detached to being oddly jerky. And it's described as being like inward speech as she tells this part of the story with cousin Edward dying as he rode the pony into town after which no one came for her. 
Mr. Southam and some lawyers went through the place. Southam told her that she would find herself penniless. He, Southam, would find her work in St. James's. And again, her voice briefly turns back to a normal tone as she asks Stephen for a point of reference in the real world. She says, do you know St. James's? And this time, unlike with the connection to Winchester, Stephen says, yes, he does. He's often stayed at Black's, the gentleman's club, when he's in London, which gets us into a whole other part of Clarissa's history here. Right. Well, Clarissa says that she worked at Mother Abbott's on the other side of the road from Black's behind Buttons, another gentleman's club here. We remember that one from before. And she has a kindness for Black's because it was a Black's member who, she says, begged me off when I was to be hanged. Mm-hmm. So apparently, like Padine's sentence being commuted to uh, transportation, Clarissa's had been as well. She asked if Stephen ever visited Mother Abbott's. And Stephen said he sometimes drank tea with Mother Abbott while his friends, as he said, went upstairs. And Clarissa says she worked in the parlor on the right, keeping accounts. So Stephen would know because he could see that from there. And she kept the men company while they waited for their girl. Mother Abbott, she said, was kind to her, taught her how to dress and undress, and never made her do anything she didn't choose to do. But that much later, when they were shorthanded and the girls were very busy, she, as she says, obliged. And Stephen excuses himself to grab a special grasshopper or cricket that that he spotted, comes back. And Clarissa says that living in a brothel was kind of like being at sea. You live with your own community and you lose touch with the world in general's ideas and language. She says, when you go out, you're as much a stranger as a sailor is on shore. Boy, we've, we've certainly had that theme, of, you know, our Jack That's ashore true. here. Well, she says that the way she grew up, you know, with her cousin, with a boarding school, now at Mother Abbott's, she never really had much of an idea about the world to begin with. And that, you know, she tried to talk to people. She tried to read novels and plays. But the novels and plays, they made out like everything revolved around the act of physical love. And for her, she said, it was not much more than blowing my nose, this act of physical love. You know, she says chastity or unchastity, neither here nor there. Absurd to make fidelity a matter of private parts. Grotesque. I took no pleasure in it except in giving a little when I happened to like the man. You know, some men were agreeable and some she felt sorry for. Wow. So we're learning a lot about Clarissa's history here and Stephen's learning for sure. She then goes on to talk about how she had tried to learn about the world from men. And she, she's had such a bizarrely disconnected life up to this point, And she's trying to fill in the gaps in her knowledge. One lonely man, as she described it, had talked to her about his greyhounds and that he was part of a menage a trois. He was living with his wife and mistress and they were great friends. He had children by both of them and they all lived together, including his mistress's kids from a former marriage. And Mike, we, I remember us talking a while ago about the difference in classes in, in Regency times and how it was the, the Victorians later on who got into the idea of a strict moral code and that actually back in the Regency times, if you're upper class, if you're an aristocrat, you can do whatever you like. So this rather sort of swinging 60s type situation that this person describes is not out of place entirely for somebody who is an aristocrat who lived by their own rules. And this gets us to an interesting connection. This then made Clarissa wonder about all the outcry against adultery. And she asks, is all this outcry actually hypocritical? And she talks about the status of this man as wearing a blue ribbon and the star of the garter. Now, Mike, this is an important signal. This is an especially important signal for those of us who are playing the long game of understanding what's going on, what are the forces ranged against Stephen and Joseph Blaine at the heart of the state, because now all of a sudden we're transported from a Polynesian island to goings-on in and around St. James's at the heart of the British establishment thousands of miles away. The Order of the Garter, to give its full name the most noble Order of the Garter, is Europe's oldest order of chivalry. That's to say the oldest order of knighthood. It's the most senior of the British orders of knights. It was founded in the 14th century. Appointments to the Order of the Garter, which still exists today, are made at the sole discretion of the monarch, usually in recognition of some kind of national contribution for public service or personal service to the sovereign. 
the membership is limited. There are 24 living members plus the Sovereign, plus the Prince of Wales and no others. The emblem of the order, you, you've probably seen it if you looked at any kind of British state emblems, is this, this blue garter with the motto On y soit qui mal y pense written on it. It's Middle French, as most school children raised at the same time as me will remember. It's Middle French that means shame on him who thinks evil of it. And it's a very, very appropriate reference for the context of the disclosures that we're hearing here about here from Clarissa. In fact, shame on him who thinks evil of it would be a pretty good motto for, for Clarissa as well as for the Order of the Garter. Right. Now, the, the, this gives us an important clue about the kind of person that she's mixing with. If you look at the, the modern day contemporary membership of the Order of the Garter, it, it's mostly old men. Uh, it includes ex-prime ministers, ex-heads of the civil service, ex-military, the ex-head of MI5 is a member of the Order of the Garter, a few aristocrats, peers who have senior ceremonial roles or roles connected to the royal household. So someone who's a Knight of the Garter, or a KG for short, is someone who is or has been at the heart of the state. So back in the world of the books, there's someone high up in the establishment hanging around St. James's Street among the clubs and the brothels. I think this might have some significance, Mike, for other aspects of the story. And let's see where this leads, and let's see what Stephen can make of it. Well, they're they're interrupted by a gunshot off in the distance. Stephen thinks it's probably Martin and Dr. Falconer. And Clarissa hopes that they don't come this way. She doesn't want to spoil talking with Stephen. You know, she's afraid that she's burdened him with her confidences and suggests that, you know, maybe they should return to the ship. Well, as they're walking, you know, she's got this blister. They're going slowly. She continues to talk randomly about the brothel's inhabitants, its customers, you know, they're curious and sometimes touching ways. And Stephen asked if she ever came across two men there together, Ledward and Ray. And she mm -hmm. says, oh, yeah, I know them well. They were often in my books. And she says that they were on the boys' side and girls only came in for something special like chains and leathers. And mm -hmm. she's shocked that they might be Stephen's friends. And he assures her that they were not his friends. Okay, now we're building up the story here. Stevens on the trail of something here. This guy with the Order of the Garter and Ledward and Ray and Mother Abbott's the brothel. And now she she goes on and says they they did seem to know. This is she's talking now about Ledward and Ray. They did know some very agreeable people. One grand person, another who wears the garter, used to join in their most curious parties. However, she had seen them. That's Ledward and Ray and this Knight of the Garter pass each other in the street several times and never acknowledge that they knew each other. Not even a nod, even though he was a duke. Stephen digs a little bit deeper. Did this person wearing the garter, the duke, have a limp? And she says he did, but wore a boot to disguise it. And Mike, j just in time to distract me back from my flash over into the usual suspects and I am Kaiser Soze. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Cla Clarissa brings us back to her, her story here. She says, Dear me, how hoarse I am. I have talked myself absolutely hoarse. I have not talked like this to anyone ever. I wish I may not have been indiscreet as well as intolerably boring. You are such a dear to have listened to me, but I am afraid I have ruined your day. End of chapter six. Ooh. Boy, I'm I'm not sure she's ruined his day at all. She might have been well on the way to it at some point, but uh what a what a series of curveballs in this chapter here. I mean, yeah. you know, perhaps some of it uh, with Clarissa's background, maybe not such a big curveball, but but I have to admit, you know, I'd almost forgotten about Ledward and Ray. I figured they're, you know, they've already been boiled, fed to the ants, stuffed, put away here. Yeah. But that highly priced protector is still out there. What a coup if Stephen could identify this man. And, you know, what an amazing source here on the other side of the world by this woman who should have been hanged and now ends up, you know, in New South Wales, now on an island with Stephen a mile away, Dr. Matron, the intelligence agent. Wow. I might... We got what we wished for, right? We, we all, like members of the crew, wanted to know more about Clarissa. And this just goes to show that when you ask to find out some more about a person, if you're really sincere about it, you're going to find out the dark side of their history as well. Uh, we get some insight onto why she is the way that she is. She's got this great desire to be liked. She 
correlates liking with being good looking as well. She has no kind of boundaries around sexual shame or desire. And how could somebody with that life experience and that outlook be anything other than a ticking time bomb on a ship like this? And Stephen clearly has passed the test to be let in onto the inside of her story here. So, so maybe then Jack's sonnet, remember the one about the expensive spirit and the waste of shame? Maybe that lesson isn't needed after all. But still, there's stuff going on, Mike. Well, you know, we've still got this regional conflict to settle in Moahu, this mission to accomplish, a further mission, you know, in South America, and perhaps a long way to home with so much going on at home. And, you know, yeah. there were so many things in Jack's family and Stephen's family. Now this intelligence work, you know, this intelligence wrinkle. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering, what is Stephen going to do with that? We're not even off of this island before getting to Moahu yet. I, I, I really wonder what's going to happen next. Yeah. So, Mike, I think there's only one thing for it. With trepidation for what we might learn in the next chapter, what do you say, in any case, to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Oh, with all my heart. of botanical specimens, but of course he has no bun. Sorry. <laughs> has no yes, bun. He no. probably does have buns. Right. There you go. <laughs> he has no birds because he had no gun. <laughs>